All right. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Welcome to the White House, and welcome to the White House briefing room. Uh, this is obviously the room where every day, or almost every day, uh, I come and do a briefing with the White House Press Corps. Uh, so these are journalists who have devoted uh, a significant portion of their lives to uh, covering the White House very closely. And um, you know, we often talk about how this is the venue where independent professional journalists ask tough questions. And this is where the President of the United States sends a senior member of his staff to come out and answer those questions. People can ask whatever they want, and the whole thing takes place on the record for everybody to see on camera. And it is uh, an important part of our democracy. And I'm glad that uh, we'll be able to do it in a way that all of you can participate in at least um, this unique way. So with that, I'm mostly interested in answering the questions that you're interested in talking about. Uh, so let's move around. So yes, this young lady in the back, I'll let you go first. My name is Victoria Crocker. I'm reporting from the Technician at North Carolina State University. And I was wondering if um, you think there's a problem with the way that the media actually reports um, negatively on the gun control issues and maybe there's not enough positive influence or positive um, press of how it has helped or Second Amendment right has helped in certain situations. Well, Victoria, this question about public perception of gun safety policy is an important one. Uh, public polls indicate that a strong majority of Americans across the country support common sense gun safety legislation. And that's not just Democrats who strongly support it. We know that many of those polls indicate that a strong majority of Republicans support common sense gun safety legislation. There are a number of other polls that indicate a majority of gun owners support common sense gun safety legislation. So it does raise some questions about what's going on here. And the President has made the point that there's no shortage of attention that's devoted to gun violence. Now, there are frequently, tragically, high profile shootings that happen all too frequently. There are also shootings that happen particularly in urban communities that happen every day that don't get any attention. And I think it is hard to assess exactly what impact all of that has on public opinion. But what the President observed, has observed is, in some ways this isn't a question about public opinion, it's a question about broken politics. Because all of the evidence indicates that a majority of the American public supports common sense, common sense gun safety legislation that would make it harder for people who, sh who shouldn't have guns from getting them. Criminals, people with mental problems. And there are laws that we can pass that don't infringe on the constitutional rights of law-abiding Americans, but could take some steps that would make it harder for people who shouldn't get a gun from getting one. And that's not going to prevent every incident of gun violence. There are people who are still going to be killed because of guns. But if we can do something to make the country just a little bit safer, to prevent even one incident of gun violence, then why wouldn't we take that action? Particularly if we know it wouldn't undermine the constitutional rights of law-abiding Americans. And the way that the President has answered this question is, we're only going to be able to pass those policies through Congress once enough people come forward and say, you know what? I'm going to be a single issue voter, Democrat or Republican. I'm only going to support somebody who supports and vows to make a priority out of common sense gun safety legislation. And the President has taken that approach himself. And he has said that he won't raise money uh, or articulate his support for someone who doesn't support that kind of common sense approach. Uh, and he hopes uh, a lot of other Americans will take the same approach. Okay. Uh, this gentleman right here. Uh, hi, my name is Nayasi Tessin Michael, and I'm reporting for the Daily Cardinal um, from the University of Wisconsin. Um, I was just wondering um, where the President's daughter will be going to college. <laughs> <laughs> that is a pertinent question uh, these days. Obviously, the, the decision deadline is coming soon. Um, we have uh, worked to assiduously protect the privacy of the President's two daughters. And they're, they're private citizens um, who uh, obviously occupy a, a fairly prominent role in uh, public life. And fortunately, much of the mainstream media has been very respectful uh, of understanding that these are two girls. They didn't run for office. They didn't ask for all this attention. Uh, but the attention uh, that is directed their way is uh, understandable. And 
Um, you know, I would anticipate that we'll uh, have an announcement about her uh, choice uh, at some point soon. We're going to do it in a way so that nobody gets scooped. We're not going to leak it to somebody. So all of the reporters that are eager to get that scoop can just relax uh, and know that, um, that we'll be making uh, an announcement at an appropriate time. Okay. Thanks for the good question. All right. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, my name is Jasmine SV. I'm reporting from the South End at Wayne State University. Um, we talked a lot about uh, student loan debt today. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions that I had, um, and I didn't hear much um, talk about admission costs for public college. And I think that's one of the, the main issues for me personally. I do have student loans and things like that, but the initial cost is the problem that I see. Um, what is the federal government doing to um, to lower public college costs so that people can afford and not have to go into debt and take out student loans in order to go to college and pursue a higher education? Yeah. This is an excellent question. You have uh, pressure on both sides, right? We want to exert upward pressure on the ability of students to afford to pay for college, but we also want to uh, uh, apply some downward pressure on the cost of college to make it a little easier for everybody to afford. That's going to save taxpayers money, uh, but it also is going to save students money as well. And we spend a lot of time talking about what the president has done to make a college education more affordable and more available to more middle class families and middle class students. So you've heard us talk about um, the Pell Grant program and how we've significantly expanded the Pell Grant program. The president fought hard for something called the American Opportunity Tax Credit that offers a tax credit to middle class families to, um, who are paying college tuition. The president recently succeeded in making that tax credit permanent. Uh, we're obviously quite pleased about that. But on the other side of the ledger, we have been looking for creative ways to try to apply some downward pressure to college costs. And there have been a range of policies that have been considered as it relates to tying federal funding for colleges and universities to their ability to keep college costs low. Now, this is a, a little bit of a controversial notion, and let me explain to you why. Too many state governments, in their zeal to cut, cut government spending, are reducing their support for public colleges and universities. That's a bad thing. That is a really poor choice. It's a short-sighted decision to make, to cut uh, an investment in something that's going to be critical to the long-term success of uh, your state. And what many college administrators legitimately say is, look, I'm getting less support from the state government. And if I want to continue to provide a high-quality education to the student body, I got to get that money from somewhere. So part of the responsibility certainly does lie at the state level. Uh, and making sure that states continue to understand that they have a responsibility to invest uh, in, the, uh, in the quality of an education that's being offered uh, at state-run institutions. Okay, move around. Uh, this gentleman in the back. Yes, you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dan Micah. I report for the uh, Truman State University Index for, uh, at Truman State University in Kersville, Missouri. Yes. Um, my home Truman state, <laughs> Dan. What's that? My home state. Yes. <laughs> uh, at Georgia State University, it takes approximately two to three weeks for a student to get their first uh, meeting with a mental health counselor, uh, and that's just not you know, not even before the heavy like midterms and finals time. So, what's the what is the administration doing to support mental health on American college campuses? Well, uh, Dan, the president has actually done uh, more than any other president to expand access to mental health care all across the country. This was, of course, included in Obamacare. The, the President made mental health care a priority by ensuring parity uh, uh, between uh, medical care that people had access to, but also mental health care uh, as well. There also was extensive funding that was included uh, in the Affordable Care Act for community health centers that often uh, are a facility that can provide uh, mental health care services. Uh, of course, uh, the Affordable Care Act also expanded Medicaid coverage, which meant more people had access to the kind of uh, health care, including mental health care, uh, that they need. So uh, this administration has certainly been at the forefront of trying to expand access to quality mental health care for people all across the country. Uh, I think the question that you're asking is also not totally unrelated to the question that was just asked, that as state-run institutions are facing tighter budgets, and as they see state governments reduce the level of support they're providing to state institutions, it means that some state schools are having to make cutbacks. 
Uh, and unfortunately, that means making cutbacks in areas that are critical to the health and well-being of the student body. Uh, and I think you identified uh, one area. So uh, this administration is certainly going to continue to look for ways to expand mental health care coverage. We're going to look for ways to provide additional support to colleges and universities that's using that money in the right way. Uh, and we're going to continue to encourage states to do the right thing. All right. Uh, yes, this young lady in the front. My name is Sonali Seth, and I go to the University of Southern California. I'm here representing the Daily Trojan. Today we talked a lot about sexual assault on college campuses, which has become an epidemic in recent years. Um, there's some controversy around the fact that universities often regulate their own sexual assault cases. So with that in mind, do you think that the federal government should provide more oversight in the regulation of sexual assault cases on college campuses? Well, the president certainly does believe that ending, ending sexual assault on college campuses should be a top priority, uh, not just of state and local governments, but also of higher education officials. Colleges and universities and the administrators who are responsible for running them have to take responsibility for addressing this problem. And this is a problem that is pervasive on college campuses. And we have seen, particularly in recent years, students become more aware of the need to make solving this problem a priority. And I think it is fair to say that on too many colleges, uh, college campuses, administrators have been a little late to the game. And there is some more work that I think can be done uh, as a policy matter to try to ensure that these situations are resolved fairly and consistent with the law, to make sure that the rights of everybody involved are properly protected and accounted for. But I think this also is the kind of situation that shouldn't just rely on government to solve, that ultimately students need to take some responsibility for the kind of campus climate that exists in their community. This is why the president has been a leading advocate of something called the It's On Us campaign. Uh, the It's On Us campaign uh, essentially is where men and women take responsibility for intervening in situations that could potentially lead to sexual abuse or a sexual assault. And it requires some social courage to step up and intervene in a situation where you might be concerned about the safety of somebody involved. And there's a natural human tendency to think to yourself, well, that looks like a messy situation. I don't want to get involved, uh, particularly when it might be a situation where alcohol or drugs could be involved. But the truth is we all need to hold ourselves accountable, not just for making sure that we are treating each other with respect, but also making sure that we're going to take responsibility for the climate and the culture on our campus. And that if we see something wrong, we're not going to hesitate to stand up and speak out and make sure that everybody that's in our community uh, is safe. Uh, so we've encouraged people to go to itsonus.org and to take the pledge. Uh, I've done that. Uh, and uh, the president and the vice president have done that. Uh, and we are hopeful that, uh, that that kind of engagement, people taking that pledge, will lead to the kind of uh, change on college campuses across the country that uh, we'd like to see and that will ultimately um, make more college students safe. Okay. All right. This gentleman right here. Hello, my name is Jesse Diamba. I'm from the University of North Texas, reporting for North Texas Television and the North Texas Daily Newspaper. Um, could, you, could your administration discuss a bit on recent um, calls in the election cycle, especially from the Democratic side, over um, making a college more affordable as in free, just like most Western European uh, nations? Um, there, we just were speaking with the Secretary of Education, John King, and we, I kind of found it ironic that the Secretary of Education for the richest country in the history of the world is still paying his graduate student debt. So could you comment, could you comment on maybe making, on the, the comments that, you know, the presidential candidates are saying um, in the future? Yeah. Well, let me just talk to you about what the, what the administration has done. Uh, so obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we've been very focused on looking for ways that we can expand the assistance that we provide. <laughs> to uh, middle class students and students that are trying to get into the middle class. We've also been looking for ways that we can expand assistance to families who are paying for uh, their child to get a college education. And we've been looking for creative policy ways that we can put downward pressure on college costs um, and making clear to college administrators that they have a responsibility to try to keep a limit on the growth in education costs. We've also been encouraging of state governments that they need to look for ways to at least protect the amount of support that they provide to uh, state-run colleges and universities, if not expand that support. 
The other thing that the President called for uh, in his State of the Union address last year, in early 2015, the President put forward a specific idea that actually is already being implemented in a handful of states, including the state of Tennessee, uh, and that is to offer a free community college education to every student that's willing to work for it. And the idea here is that if you can offer up a free community college education to hardworking students that are getting good grades and doing their homework and uh, 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 continuing to maintain a, uh, um, a workload, that you can essentially cut the cost of a four-year education in half. The first two years at a community college they could get for free. Uh, and that would make a tangible uh, impact on the ability of students who are trying to prepare themselves for a 21st century global economy. It also would have an impact on, uh, I think, what are often called non-traditional college students. That you have people who uh, have started out their career in one field, and either they lose their job or they recognize they want to change to a different field, but they can't move to that new job until they get some additional training. So giving more workers the opportunity to um, go to community college for a couple of years, have that paid for by the federal, by the federal government, uh, and then come out with enhanced skills that would allow them to make an even better contribution to the local economy, that's a win-win. And this is what they've done in the state of Tennessee, and it's been very uh, beneficial to the state. Uh, they've seen uh, an economic benefit uh, associated with uh, a better educated workforce. Uh, so the President has proposed, look, if there's a Republican governor in the state of Tennessee who can make this program work in his state, why shouldn't, we, why shouldn't Democrats and Republicans work together in Washington to give that opportunity to every American? Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Republicans have been resistant to this idea. Uh, even, uh, you know, these are Republicans in Congress have been resistant to this idea, even though Republicans in Tennessee have seen firsthand that it works great. So uh, the President's going to continue to, to advocate uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this kind of reform. Uh, and uh, is hopeful that we can build some momentum uh, such that um, you know, maybe the next Congress uh, would be w more willing to take it up than this one has been. Okay. Uh, yes, this young lady right there. Hi. My name is Erica Evans, and I'm from Stanford University. I write for the Stanford Daily. Um, the role of the press secretary is to be an honest broker between the administration and the press. How do you balance making the president look good with honestly communicating all sides of the policies that the administration is pursuing? And also, how do you think journalists can improve their coverage of government affairs? Uh -huh. That is a good question. <laughs> how long do you have? <laughs> I have um, worked to conspicuously avoid playing media critic uh, in this role. Um, it might affect my ability to be an honest broker. Uh, if I spend a lot of time critiquing the performance of the independent press corps. Um, so I think I'm going to dodge your second question, but let me see if I can give you a thoughtful uh, answer to your first one. The basic function of the press secretary is to help the American people understand what the president's doing and why he's doing it. In some ways, that's the, that is the basic function of the job. Reporters have a similar mandate that they want to give their readers or their viewers or their listeners greater insight into what it is the President's doing and try to help their readers or listeners understand why he's doing it. So, you know, the approach that I have taken is to try to learn those facts for myself, to not just understand sort of the basic talking points, but to actually try to delve into the policy and understand why particular decisions have been made, either by the President or by uh, other senior decision makers in his administration. Uh, and then to also try to put those decisions into context to help people understand the President's approach to problem solving or the President's approach to a whole set of issues so that they can understand why a particular decision uh, was made. As people sort of assess the relationship between the White House Press Corps and the White House Press Office, the thing that I often remind journalists who occasionally will decide to write about this issue is that there's supposed to be some tension between the White House Press Office and the White House Press Corps. If there wasn't, it'd be a pretty good indication that somebody wasn't doing their job. If there's ever a day that one of the professionals in the White House Press Corps walks into my office and says, you know, you guys have been totally transparent today. You've answered all of my questions. You've given me access to all the information that I need. Thanks a lot. I have no complaints. They're not doing their job. Even if we have been extraordinarily transparent, which we have been. <laughs> 
it's incumbent upon those journalists to come in and say, you should give us more. That's their job. And it's my job to try to be as accommodating as I can, while at the same time protecting the president's ability to make a decision, but also making sure that the context of that decision is not lost. So that's why reporters who are interested in having a positive working relationship with the White House, my expectation for them is that not that they're going to write stories that are good for the White House every day, that make the president look good or make the White House look good or make the um, administration look good. Sometimes there are tough stories. And you know, when you consider some of the more complicated uh, questions that this administration has had to deal with, it's plausible that people are going to read stories that don't make the president or the administration or the White House look good. Uh, the situation in Syria right now is tragic. There are millions of innocent people who have been displaced from their homes. And th the administration and the president has put forward a bold strategy that exceeded the, ex the original expectations that people had for what we would be able to do to influence this situation. But so far, it continues to be the case that there are innocent people dying in Syria. And so many stories that are written about Syria don't make the president look good. But what I challenge reporters to do is even if we accept that the situation in Syria is bad and it's a situation that the White House and the president has not solved, despite how hard he has worked to try, what I do want people to understand is why is the situation so complicated? What is it that the president has tried to do? And why is it that he's tried that approach and not something else? And if people, if reporters succeed in using their skills as a journalist and as a writer and a storyteller and a broadcaster to explain our approach, then I can't really complain. Uh, they've done their job. And if I have confidence in our approach, then I'm going to have confidence in the idea that if somebody makes an honest effort to explain that approach to the American people, well, then we're going to persuade some people that what we're doing is the right thing to do, uh, even if it's not showing the immediate results that we would like. So. All right. Uh, this gentleman right here. Hi, Dominic Sanfilippo with Flyer News at the University of Dayton in Ohio. Hey, Dominic. Uh, bouncing off the previous couple questions about access, I was wondering if you could comment on the access or, in some cases, reduced lack of access um, of young people in college students across the country to fully participate in public service in the life of um, our country. Uh, there's been reports in the past couple of years about uh, certain sorts of possible echo chambers that pop up in D.C because of the lack of availability for funding for internships for places like the White House where we sit today, Congress, other federal agencies, et cetera. Um, there's a tension there, obviously, because the idea of public service necessitates something. But on the other hand, um, if some people are boxed out of being able to participate while they're in college, something like we're very lucky to do today, there's tens of thousands more of us who would love to be able to sit in this yeah. seat right now. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could comment on any possible changes in the ways of the White House or across the federal government uh, access for college students going forward to more fully participate and represent the mosaic of America in D.C. Yeah. Look, the president often says that the most important role in our democracy uh, is not the role of president, but actually the role of citizen. And looking for ways to engage people uh, in the process of governing this country uh, is something that the president has made a priority. And he, this is one of the reasons that we're hosting this event here today, is the president's interested in cultivating your interest uh, in government, and certainly your interest in uh, playing in a role, uh, a, an important role in our democracy by uh, considering a career as a, uh, as a professional journalist. So I, I, think that's the, I think that's the first way that I, I would answer your question. The, the second way is that people don't have to work in politics uh, or even cover politics full time uh, in order to be engaged in our democracy. What people do have to do is they have to make an effort to go and inform themselves and educate themselves about what's happening uh, in, in your community or in our country. Uh, and that, that is a big challenge. Uh, and that's not something that the government can do for you. And that's not something that necessarily includes a paycheck. But that is a responsibility that we all have as citizens of this country to educate ourselves about uh, the questions that are being raised about our government, uh, to uh, establish some priorities in our own right for um, the direction of the country. And um, you know, one of the observations that the President often makes about the media is that, uh, that there are places you can go on the Internet to just go and read articles or opinions written by a whole bunch of people just like you who have the same views. 
And it requires a certain amount of self-discipline to actually seek out different points of view. Uh, soliciting uh, or uh, inviting input uh, from people who may not share your worldview is a, is a valuable thing. And it's something that is critical if we're going to be um, good citizens of our country and active participants in our democracy. And um, you know, the president gave, a, as you think about this, the president gave a, a commencement address uh, at the University of Michigan uh, where he talked a lot about sort of the role of uh, citizenship uh, in a modern democracy like ours. Uh, so you can hear more uh, directly from the president about that. Okay. All right, uh, this young lady right there. Um, hi, earlier today we talked with senior advisor um, Valerie Jarrett on restorative justice works like within um, school districts for students who have been like suspended or expelled. And my question is, um, what is the administration doing to um, to work with school districts who want to go after that those initiative acts? And also my name is Zion Daniel and I'm from Bennett College and I am, I'm reporting on behalf of Bell Magazine. Great, it's nice to meet you. The you may have heard a little bit about this from um, Secretary uh, John King. The Department of Education has worked closely with uh, states and school districts across the country. Uh, and I know that Secretary King's predecessor, uh, Arne Duncan, was very interested in this issue as well. What you often find in the federal government, particularly when it comes to education, uh, is that we have a tradition in this country of local control of schools. And that's a good thing. We want communities to be engaged uh, and to play uh, the predominant role. Uh, in setting policies and, uh, and guidelines for how the schools uh, in those communities are going to operate. But what the federal government can do is to offer some expertise uh, and to share best practices uh, and bring schools and administrators together to help them understand how these problems uh, are being handled in other communities. And so what this administration has done is made an effort to try to lift up best practices, to seek out the most effective educators, particularly when it comes to disciplinary policies. Uh, and make sure that we're sharing those ideas with other schools. Uh, and there's plenty of academic data uh, and research to indicate that there is some bias inherent in the way that some schools administer discipline. Uh, and that does put some students, particularly minority students, uh, at a disadvantage. Uh, and helping well-intentioned administrators recognize the potential for bias uh, and give them some tips for how to work around it uh, and uh, overcome it uh, is a really valuable thing. And I know that this is something that the, the Department of Education has made a real priority. Okay. All right. Others? Yes, that gentleman right there. Sean Bassett. I'm from the MSU spokesman at Morgan State University. Right. Nice to see you, Sean. What is the future of historically black colleges and universities at the Obama, at the, the Obama administration? Yeah. Well, uh, under President Obama's leadership, uh, funding for uh, historically black colleges and universities has increased. Uh, President Obama has had an opportunity to uh, deliver a couple of commencement addresses at HBCUs. Uh, in both of those speeches, the President has talked about how uh, important a role those institutions play, not just in a modern African American community in the United States, but actually a role they have to play uh, in our country. Uh, the President's actually going to speak at Howard uh, University uh, later this summer at their commencement. Uh, the President's looking forward to that opportunity. And, uh, you know, it would be an opportunity for him to both reflect on the tradition that's built into uh, HBCUs of uh, providing a good, uh, high-quality education to uh, African Americans. Uh, but he'll also talk about the responsibility that those who graduate from those kinds of institutions have to contribute not just to the African American community, but to our country as a whole. Uh, and uh, this is something the President feels strongly about, and uh, something he'll talk about again uh, later this summer when he speaks at Howard. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Kate Carejo from the Ford of Ram at Ford University, um, and we just released our sexual assault climate survey, or the results of the survey, rather, um, and uh, it turned out Fordham is reporting sexual assault just a little bit above the national average. This is around 5% right now. We're reporting at 8%. So I was wondering if the administration is doing anything to um, incentivize uh, colleges to increase that percentage to make it easier and more accessible for um, victims to report their sexual assault so we can get more accurate numbers on how sexual assault um, is this on college campuses. Yeah. Well, the... Um that seems like a bad thing. Look at this. It's that remote there, guys. Watch it, turn it down.
There we go. That's never happened before. So, I'm sorry that had to happen to you. Uh, you've asked a very serious question. Uh, what the uh, administration has done is tried to uh, work with colleges and universities uh, to help them establish uh, a clear process for reporting uh, these kinds of crimes when they occur uh, and making sure that there's a process internally for uh, handling them appropriately consistent with fairness but also consistent with the law. Um, so that is certainly uh, an important step. The other thing that we believe is important is transparency. Uh, that uh, as students are considering which college uh, or institution to attend, uh, they should understand exactly what the uh, climate is like on that campus. How safe are they going to be if they go to school there? How much of a priority have school administrators made uh, the safety of their students? Uh, so uh, that kind of transparency uh, uh, is important as well. Uh, but look, you know, as I, as I was saying earlier, this, this can't just be about uh, government. This also has to be about uh, students taking responsibility for what happens on their campus uh, and what kind of community do they want to be a part of uh, and how willing are they to uh, engage in that community to uh, assert the kinds of norms uh, and mutual respect that, uh, that we'd all like to have, particularly when we're living on a, on a, in a community like a college campus where um, you know, we're sort of encouraged to try new things uh, and to explore um, you know, uh, new experiences. Uh, that that having a, a, a safe environment in which to do that is particularly important. Okay. Other questions? Yes, that gentleman right there. Um, I'm Jacob Solis from the University of Nevada reporting for the Nevada Sagebrush. Uh, we've heard a lot today, especially from um, the Education Secretary, of uh, pay-as-you-earn uh, loan repayment plans for student loans. Mm -hmm. However, the reason we're talking about it is because 70%, according to the, the GAO, 70% of delinquent borrowers are eligible for uh, pay-as-you-earn but aren't on the plan. How did that number get so high? Yeah. Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that the pay-as-you-earn program is something that's relatively new. Uh, and we are setting a goal today to try to expand the number of people who take advantage of this program. The pay-as-you-earn pay program essentially caps your student loan repayment rates at 10% of, uh, of your income. Um, the president has also fought hard to establish the CFPB. Hey. And, oh, well. I hear there's some pot uh, journalists here. You know, Josh was uh, speaking for me, and I want to make sure he was getting it right. How's it going, everybody? Hey. Are you guys uh, having an interesting time here? Was Josh thorough in his briefing? Well, I heard uh, you guys were around today, so I wanted to stop by and say hello. Uh, I also have a bit of breaking news for you, and then I might take some questions. Uh, I, I heard, overheard Josh talking about student loans, and I know that's a big priority for a lot of your listeners and readers. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why my administration has spent a lot of time focused on college affordability. So we expanded Pell Grants to make sure that more young people could access it. We created the pay-as-you-earn program uh, that uh, ensures that people can cap the amount that they're repaying on their loans each month uh, and so that young people who want to go into jobs that don't uh, aren't as lucrative uh, are still able to pursue their passions and their dreams uh, while managing their debt load. Uh, today, I want to announce that we're aiming to enroll 2 million more people in pay-as-you-earn by this time next year. And you can find out how at studentloans.gov slash repay. That's studentloans.gov slash repay. And uh, we're also going to be making some additional announcements about how we're going to get our agencies coordinating so that as young people are managing their student loan debt, there's one-stop shopping. They can figure out how to do it and they can make sure that uh, their consumer protections in terms of how they're being treated uh, in their repayment process. Uh, while I have you here, I might as well mention a couple other things. Uh, you may have heard that there is a Supreme Court vacancy. Uh, for those of you who have been studying our system of government, we have three branches and one of the most important is the judiciary. And right now our Supreme Court 
is absent uh, one sitting member uh, with the passing of Justice Scalia. I've nominated an individual named Merrick Garland, who's currently the chief judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the second most important court in the land. Uh, by all accounts, he is extremely well qualified. And uh, traditionally, what's happened is, is that the Senate then exercising his constitutional duties of uh, advise and consent will meet with the judge and then have a hearing for him and then have a vote. Uh, in part because uh, politics have gotten so polarized lately and the importance of this seat, so far at least uh, the Republican leader on the Senate side, Mitch McConnell, uh, has refused to uh, have the Republican caucus meet with him and schedule uh, an actual vote, although to their credit there have been a number of Republicans who have broken ranks and gone ahead and met with Judge Garland. Uh, I mention this because I think it's important for all of you while you're in town uh, and many of you who are going to end up being journalists covering important uh, national policy to recognize that uh, our system only works when, even when we have big disagreements, even when there are big policy disputes, uh, there is still a willingness to follow the rules and treat people fairly, uh, especially uh, those who are on the other side of the debate. Uh, that's something that's been lost a little bit in this town of late. And as I said at my State of the Union address, uh, my hope is, is that despite uh, some of the unusual rhetoric that we've been hearing during this presidential campaign, uh, that it's young people like you who are going to restore that sense of uh, us being able to work together and make this democracy function effectively. Uh, and journalists are, play a, a critical role in that. Uh, you know, sometimes both Josh and I uh, probably uh, have our disagreements with the press corps and uh, feel picked on or misunderstood. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, and I've said this before, uh, what separates us out in part from a lot of other countries in the world is we've got this incredible uh, free press that pokes and prods and calls into account uh, our leaders. And uh, that is how we can make sure that leaders are accountable to the people who elect them. Uh, and that's how we make sure that you don't see major abuses of power. And when you do, that, uh, in fact, the American people know about it uh, and are able to make changes. And so you guys are going to have a critical role, those of you who end up following journalism. Um, I hope many of you do. I want to thank the uh, White House Press Corps because I understand they gave you uh, a lot of time today and uh, some of the best journalists in the country uh, operate here. I normally don't say nice things about them in front of them. <laughs> but I figured since they, uh, since they took the time to, to work with you today, I wanted to make sure to acknowledge uh, the great work that they are doing. All right? So with that, I'm going to take a couple of questions. All right, let's see. Uh, we'll start with that young man right there in the black suit. Or blue, I guess. <laughs> well, no, no, right here, right here in the red tie. Okay. But I may get, uh, you know, I may get to you too. So, uh, Mr. President, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my name is Dan Corey, and I'm the editor in chief of the Daily Targo. It's the second oldest college newspaper in the United States, and it serves uh, the Rutgers University New Brunswick community. How's that? We recently ran a student referendum to keep our presence on campus <coughs> we passed and we are allowed to continue publishing and we're actually going to reach a historic 150 years of publication. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also very nervous right now. But <laughs> <laughs> you're doing great so far. Just never admit that you're nervous. <laughs> Just pretend like this is routine. Uh, well, in light of the news of you speaking at our commencement, I was wondering, um, would you be interested in being interviewed by our newspaper? <laughs> you know, that, that's a good use of your time right there. Um, you know, I have to say that normally I coordinate uh, carefully with my press team before uh, we grant interviews, but uh, uh, I am favorably disposed towards giving you uh, a little bit of time. Uh, it may not be a really long interview, but, uh, but I figure you give the college newspaper a little bit of That's a, good idea. a little bit of play. So, all right, uh, young lady, right here. Mr. President, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm the chapter 
reporting for the Spectrum newspaper and the Pulse Television News Magazine show at Star University. Um, my question is, you announced the other day that you'll be uh, visiting Flint, Michigan, based on a letter received from a young girl. Um, what are you planning to do during your visit there, and have you heard from the girl um, in response to your visit? And if possible, after, may I take a photo with you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the photo I can't do, because if I do, then I've got a long line. All right, uh, but uh, uh, I will be visiting Flint, and uh, obviously, since uh, the news of of the terrible things that have been taking place there, uh, the lead uh, in the drinking water and the potential health hazards, as well as uh, the people who were responsible for the health and safety of those residents uh, not carrying out their duties the way they need to. I think uh, it's important not only for us to have responded uh, as we have with FEMA and uh, that's the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency that uh, uh, responds to a, a lot of problems like this. Uh, it, it's important not only that we are helping uh, the city uh, plan over the long term, uh, but I think it's also important for me to shine a spotlight on the fact that uh, Flint, uh, although extreme, is not unique. That we have underinvested in uh, some of our basic infrastructure that we rely on for our public health. And uh, hopefully it will give me a chance to uh, speak to the nation as a whole about how we need to uh, ensure that our air is clean, our water is clean, and that uh, uh, our kids are safe. And I hope I get a chance to meet that young lady as well. Thank you. All right. Young man right here. Hello, Mr. Obama. It's a pleasure. I'm Jesse Diamba from the University of North Texas. And I just had two questions for you. Um, first of all, what is your proudest achievement you've um, achieved here in these eight years? And um, after January 20th, what are your goals or plans after uh -huh. you leave um, the White House? Well, I, you know, I'm proud of a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, providing health insurance to 20 million people who didn't have it and, and setting us on the path where uh, hopefully everybody has health insurance that's affordable uh, and uh, high quality. Uh, I'm proud about the work we did to save the economy, because uh, right after I came in, we uh, were in a free fall and could have experienced a, a worldwide depression. Uh, I'm proud of the reforms we've done on Wall Street to make sure that uh, the recklessness that led to the crisis hopefully doesn't happen again. Uh, I'm proud of the work we've done in education to make sure that uh, millions of kids who previously couldn't afford to go to college can, uh, and that uh, in addition to the work we've done on student uh, student debt and, and reducing that, uh, we've also been doing things to make it, uh, the process of encouraging young people to go to college uh, uh, easier. And uh, you know, I, I, this is a good time for me to give a shout out to the first lady who, uh, as uh, many of you know, just this week had uh, her annual sign up getting young people to uh, apply for the FAFSA form that is the gateway for you to be able to get uh, financial aid. Uh, she was up in New York, but it was, a, I think, a thousand participants uh, nationwide who were uh, helping to uh, let young people know if you are willing to work hard uh, and have a vision for your future, then uh, nothing's preventing you from, from getting the kind of higher education that you need. Uh, so I'm proud of all that stuff. I, probably the thing I'm most proud of is that uh, um, mainly as uh, the uh, assistant to Michelle Obama, I've done, <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I've raised uh, two daughters who were uh, amazing that, and uh, I'm, I'm really, really proud of them. Um, and, and being able to do that while still uh, you know, focused on my job, uh, I think, is, is something I, uh, I'll look back on and, and appreciate. I, you know, I'm, I'm really busy right now, so I'm not thinking too much about uh, after the presidency. Uh, typically, presidents uh, build libraries, but I'm more interested in the pro programming, not just a building. And I'm very confident that a lot of the programming that I do will relate to young people and how I can encourage them to get involved in civic life. All right. Uh, let's see. 
you know, I'm, I'm trying to alternate boy, girl, boy, girl here, uh, just to be fair. Uh, young lady right there in the red. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, my name's Danielle. Hey. <laughs> and I'm reporting for uh, Newswatch Ole Miss at the University of Mississippi. And pending the Supreme Court's decision, um, will this administration take further action in immigration? Uh, as you know, we uh, took some initial steps to try to make a more rational, smarter immigration process. Our immigration system has been broken for quite some time. Um, on the one hand, uh, you've had uh, some serious work uh, by our administration and previous administrations to slow the flow of uh, undocumented uh, workers across the border, to strengthen border security, uh, to improve how we manage uh, uh, the influx of folks who uh, come in uh, by air and to make sure that they're not overstaying their visas and so forth. On the other hand, we also want to remind everybody this is a nation of immigrants, and immigrants, immigration has been a source of strength for our country, and that uh, we have uh, people here who may not have initially come here legally, but have since that time put down roots, raised families, there are neighbors, there are friends, they may be uh, in some cases, uh, you know, seeing their sons and daughters go off to war in our country's uniform, and uh, that it doesn't make sense for us to simply uh, pretend like we're going to uh, send all those folks out, and instead we should bring them out of the shadows and give them a chance to earn uh, uh, legal uh, residence and ultimately citizenship. So uh, we put forward a plan. Part of it we were able to implement, the DREAM Act uh, kids who were, uh, we were able to make sure were treated like the young Americans that they are. Uh, we then had an, uh, an additional program uh, through administrative action that the Supreme Court uh, put a stay on, or the lower courts put a stay on, and is about to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, in part, uh, uh, the process takes a long time generally, with uh, the Supreme Court one justice short. It'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, they can come to a ruling or whether they're, uh, they arrive at a tie, a 4-4 tie. We don't know yet. That's pending. Um, in the meantime, we're still implementing a number of reforms and changes uh, to make the, system, the legal immigration system smoother, not as expensive, fairer to people, uh, to treat families with more respect. Uh, we have changed our priorities in terms of enforcement so that we're not deporting and, and separating families as much and more focused on going after criminals uh, and people who uh, pose a security threat to the community. Uh, but our hands are a little bit tied on some of the bigger things until uh, the Supreme Court uh, rules. Now, even if we do all that, it's critically important that we uh, still push Congress to pass legislation because my executive orders can be overturned by the next president. Uh, and. Uh, the only way to have a permanent solution to this problem is for the kind of legislation to pass that we saw the Senate actually pass on a bipartisan basis uh, that would uh, continue to strengthen border security but also give a pathway to citizenship for uh, those who had been here for quite some time. Uh, that way we can be a nation of law and a nation of immigrants uh, and it's the right thing to do. Uh, I'm not optimistic about us getting the legislation done before I leave given the makeup of this Congress. Um, but I think this is going to be a major issue in the election and uh, people need to pay attention to it. All right, I'm going to take two more, two more questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, you're, you're, you're all very good looking people, i got to say. <laughs> the, uh, this gentleman over here. I haven't forgotten about you over there. Go ahead. My name is Alden Woods. I work for the Indian Davis at Indian University. Uh, my question is about Syrian refugees. Uh, you I thought you were going to ask about basketball wins. <laughs> You can do that if you want. No, go ahead. Um, as the deadline for your pledge to let in 10,000 Syrian refugees gets kind of closer, starting to creep up on us, uh, it looks kind of iffy whether that's going to be made. Do you have any plans 
to speed up that flow or encourage more yeah. Syrian refugees coming into the country? Well, we're going to keep on pushing. Uh, and uh, part of what has made this challenging uh, is that uh, we want to make sure that uh, we can, as much as possible, uh, provide the American people an assurance that everybody here has been vetted at a very high standard. Um, as you will recall, there was a lot of emotions around our initial announcement that we should be uh, admitting some Syrian refugees and people making claims that somehow uh, this would be uh, letting potential terrorists uh, uh, onto uh, our shores. The truth of the matter is, is that the refugee process generally uh, is much more rigorous in its, in its screening and its vetting than the average tourist who comes in here. Uh, these are people who themselves have been victims of terrorism and victims of incredible violence uh, and suffering at the hands of the uh, Assad regime in Syria. Uh, it is the right thing to do. Uh, our closest friends and allies, like Canada, like Germany, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, European countries, as well as uh, countries bordering Syria, like Turkey and Jordan, have taken on an enormous burden. And as uh, you know, the most powerful nation on earth, it's important for us to, to do our uh, duty as well here, uh, uh, our humanitarian obligation. And uh, uh, it's important for us to send a signal around the world that uh, we care about these folks. So. Uh, Administratively, I think now we have the process to speed it up. Uh, there may be efforts on the part of Congress to try to block us, uh, but our goal is to continue uh, to try to make the case to Congress and the American people this is the right thing to do, and we believe that we can uh, hit those marks before the end of the year. Uh, more broadly, one of the things we're going to be doing is at the United Nations, we're going to convene uh, at the margins of the United Nations General Assembly, which takes place in September every year. We're going to try to uh, make sure that we have a, uh, an international conference around how we can deal with much larger refugee flows generally, uh, some of them as a consequence of conflict, in some cases because of drought or other natural disasters. There are about 60 million displaced people around the world. Uh, and I've met with some of them, not just in uh, those who are fleeing uh, areas like Syria, but also in Southeast Asia and uh, parts of Africa. And a lot of these folks are your age or younger, have the same hopes, dreams, aspirations, and uh, have just been dealt a very bad hand. Uh, we can't solve every problem in the world, but we have to make sure that we take leadership in, in trying to help stabilize their lives. Okay? Uh, all right, I'll take two more because I promised that I was going to get that young man who thought I had called on him. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President, for joining us here today. My name is Sonali Seth, and I'm from the University of Southern California, here representing the Daily Trojan. In light of your Pell Grant announcement today, it seems like a central tenet of your administration's strategy in addressing college affordability is increasing access to grants and loans. How sustainable would you say the strategy is in addressing the long-term rising trends of the cost of college? That's a great question. It is not sustainable if uh, the overall cost of college keeps on going up as fast as it's going up. So one of the things that we have to do, even as we make sure that we're providing more access to grants, keeping uh, loans uh, manageable, interest rates, at a reasonable level, uh, we still have to work with colleges and universities to figure out new ways to reduce costs. Uh, and we've actually seen universities around the country begin experiments uh, that are having some impact. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, I, I made an announcement uh, a while back about our initiative for making the first two years of community college free. That's something that is affordable for most states to do, and we are prepared to help. 
uh, with uh, federal support. If we were able to do that, and we could just close a few loopholes that corporations currently use to avoid paying taxes to pay for it, then for a large proportion of young people who either get their primary, secondary school education from a community college or started a community college and then transfer to a four-year university for graduation, uh, their costs are being cut anywhere from half to 100%, uh, down to zero. And this is something achievable. Now, Congress has not moved on our proposal, but what we've also seen is that there have been 27 jurisdictions around the country that have taken us up on this challenge and are doing it themselves, uh, are, are figuring out ways uh, to make this happen. So that's an, uh, one example. A second example, uh, some of you, because I can tell that you guys were high achieving type A folks, uh, <laughs> unlike the kind of slacker kid that I was. Um, some of you, I suspect, were taking college credit courses while you were in high school. Uh, and what we've seen is a number of, of high school systems or, or public school systems partner with community colleges and universities so that they make arrangements. You start taking your college credits while in high school and you extend your what seems like high school for an extra year and when you graduate you now have an associate's degree so you have the equivalent of a community college degree when you then go to uh, a four-year institution you have enough credits that you can graduate in three years uh, instead of four uh, that again by eliminating one year means that you've just reduced your your costs significantly there's been discussion of how can we use technology uh, to cut costs uh, are there ways in which uh, we can take the best practices of online learning uh, and make that more accessible for young people who may not have the luxury of you know, being on a campus for four years with room and board, might have to work part-time uh, because they need to help their families or support themselves. Uh, are there ways that we can make that work? And we have to be careful about that because there have been some for-profit institutions that frankly haven't done a very good job they take the money, but uh, the young person who, uh, you know, who's taking classes with them doesn't end up getting uh, a degree that's useful for them getting a job, and then they have problems repaying their loans. Uh, but there's no doubt that if done well, that technology potentially can reduce costs. And then we're talking to colleges and universities about what are the contributors to these higher costs. Um, and, and this may be sensitive to some folks, but I, I've said this before. Um, it, if you have the option of cutting your college costs in half, but your dorm rooms aren't quite as nice, or the sports facilities or the student center or the cafeteria aren't as good, is that a deal you're willing to take? And you know, can we figure out how to uh, empower more parents and more students uh, to demand uh, a lower cost option that still gives you a great education but maybe doesn't have all the bells and whistles to it. Um, and that's part of the reason why we put forward this college report card. The idea is just it, it, it provides you online data so that as you're selecting a college or, uh, or university that you're able to see all right, what are the costs, what are the graduation rates, um, all the indicators and benchmarks of getting good value for what you're uh, what you're spending, and uh, you know this is this has been a long-term trend of ever rising college costs. Um, the good news is is that through the work that we've done over the last several years, we've started to see some good trends: delinquencies, uh, hardship deferrals, uh, defaults on student loans have started to go in the, a better direction. Uh, they were skyrocketing. Some of that is the improvement of the economy generally. Some of it is some of the policies that we've uh, engaged in. But we're going to have to keep on working with universities to make sure that we're uh, doing a smarter, better job uh, in order for the people who are coming behind you uh, to be able to afford college. All right? Last question. Uh, the gentleman right there. Uh, kind of president. Um, earlier today, we spoke about. What's uh, your name? Patrick Ford from the Fresno City College Rampage. From uh, what? 
Fresno City College. Fresno City College, fantastic. Um, earlier today, we talked. One thing we talked about was a civic engagement, and a line you used in the State of the Union address of "Don't give in to the cynicism <laughs> of the day." Right. Uh, poll released by Reuters yesterday showed that uh, nearly half of Americans feel that um, uh, the elections are rigged in some way. Um, do you, is there any goal or plan for the administration to help revitalize the faith in democracy that is seeming to be lacking? Well, you know what? The, the, this is something that I've tried to do ever since I got into public office. As you know, I came into uh, this work as a community organizer and strongly believe that our democracy only works when people participate. Um, you know, there are a lot of forces that feed cynicism. Uh, and there's no dispute that our democracy is not working as well as it should. Uh, I can tell you uh, some of the reasons for that. Uh, one of it is that uh, we have set up uh, a system for electing state legislatures and members of Congress that involve the drawing of district lines that are uh, gerrymandered. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the phrase, it basically means that uh, those who are already in power draw the maps in such a way where they can be assured that these are either going to be Democratic seats or Republican seats. And what that's done is it's made very few seats competitive. Uh, so, for example, in the last election in 2012, Democrats actually cast substantially more votes in, uh, in congressional elections, uh, but ended up with substantially fewer seats. Uh, and the reason for that is, in 2010, when the census was done and redistricting of congressional and House legislative seats uh, were drawn, uh, Republican governors and Republican uh, majorities uh, were responsible for drawing most of the seats. Uh, now, uh, you know, I, I want to be clear, Democrats aren't blameless on this either. Uh, but California, for example, has gone to a process of nonpartisan districting. The advantage there is not only do you make more seats competitive, but it also means that uh, politicians have to compete for everybody's votes because they're not in safe seats. They're not in a safely Republican uh, district or Democratic district. And what that does is it means uh, they've got to not just appeal to the extremes of their party. Part of the reason we've seen polarization and gridlock here in Washington is because uh, there's been this great sorting and Democrats have moved much further, uh, have, have moved left. Republicans have just gone way to the right. And uh, it's harder than to compromise because uh, members of Congress, and this same thing is true in, in state legislatures, are always looking over their shoulders seeing if somebody in their own party uh, might challenge them. And then the system doesn't work. So that's a big chunk of uh, why people are cynical, because uh, they feel like they don't, uh, their votes don't count. And if you draw districts that are ironclad one party or another, then they're not entirely wrong. Another uh, reason that people are cynical is money in politics. Uh, the Supreme Court issued a, a ruling, Citizens United, that allowed uh, super PACs and uh, very wealthy individuals to just finance all these ads that you guys see on TV all the time. Half the time, nobody knows who's funding them. And uh, that makes you cynical, partly because most of this money is spent on negative ads. And so you're just hearing constantly how horrible everybody is. Uh, that'll make you feel pretty bad about the political process. And uh, I'm a strong believer in uh, you know, finding ways in which we can make the financing of campaigns more democratic. Now, we've seen some interesting work being done for, you know, you've got to give Bernie Sanders, for example, credit. Um, building off some of the work that I did, I in turn <coughs> built off the work that Howard Dean did for smaller donations, grassroots donors uh, to uh, be able to, in small contributions to allow candidates to be competitive. But I think that uh, we don't want to leave that to chance. Uh, and that's much harder to do for members of Congress uh, who are lower profile so they don't get the uh, sort of viral presence that allows them to raise that kind of money to compete. So we're going to have to solve money in politics. Um, 
you as journalists are going to have a role to play in reducing cynicism. It is very hard to get good stories placed. You know, people will uh, assign you stories about what's not working. It's very hard for you to write a story about, wow, this thing really works good. And just to take the federal government as an example, every day I've got two million people who work for the federal government, whether in our military, our law enforcement, our uh, you know, environmental protection, helping veterans, et cetera, and they are doing great work. And you rely on it in all kinds of ways, including when you check the weather, because you can thank uh, the National Weather Service for putting satellites up so your smartphones tell you whether to bring an umbrella or not. But we just take that for granted. And if out of those two million employees, one person screws up somewhere, which every day you can count on somebody out of two million people probably uh, doing something uh, they shouldn't be doing, that, that's what's going to get reported on. Now, that helps keep government on its toes and accountable. Uh, but one of the things we have to think about is how do we tell a story about the things we do together that actually work uh, so that people don't feel so cynical uh, overall. Um, but look, he, he, here's, here's, here's the bottom line, uh, is that let's take the political process. As cynical as everybody is, and everybody's always trying to come up with these radical new plans to try to fix our democracy, and we need to do this and we need to do that. The truth is, is that part of the reason why our government doesn't work as well is because in a good presidential year, slightly more than half the people vote who are eligible, and the other half don't. And during an off-year election, when the president's not at the top of the ticket and people aren't getting as much attention, 40% of the people vote. Now, this system doesn't work if people opt out. And the easiest cure, the simplest cure for what ails our democracy is everybody voting. Now, it's true that there's some states that purposely make it hard for people to vote. We're the only major democracy in the world that actively makes it hard for people to vote. Uh, and so you should be, particularly as uh, in, in your student newspapers, as you go back to your home states, you should be asking, why is it that we have laws that are purposely making it harder for people to vote, purposely making it harder for young people to vote? And, and there's a political agenda there. The people in power don't want things to change. They want cynicism. Because obviously the existing system is frustrating as it is for everybody else, works for them. Well, if you want to upend that, we got to vote. But even in those states that purposely make it harder to vote, the truth of the matter is on your college campuses, half the folks, maybe two-thirds of the folks who don't vote, don't vote because they're just not paying attention. They don't consider it important. And they're not willing to take the 15 minutes or half hour that it takes to make sure that you're registered and make sure you actually vote. Well, if you care about climate change, you care about college costs, you care about uh, career opportunities, you care about war and peace and refugees, you can't just complain. You got to vote. And what's interesting is, is young people, uh, as a uh, as a voting block, are the least likely to vote. But when you do vote, have the biggest impact on elections. During a presidential year, young people account for like 19 percent of the total vote. During an off-year election, when folks aren't paying as much attention, they account for 12 percent. And that means that the kinds of candidates that get elected and the priorities that they reflect are entirely different, just based on whether or not you guys are going to the polls. So don't let people tell you that 
what you do doesn't matter. It does. Don't give away your power. That should be the main message that you deliver uh, all the time. And it doesn't matter you know, uh, whether it's you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, whether you're conservative on some issues, liberal on others. If you participate and you take the time to be informed about the issues and you actually turn out and your peers turn out, you change the country. You do. It may not always happen as fast as you'd like, but you'll change it. So I'll keep on talking about this even after I leave the presidency. I'm, th 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 this is, you got me started. I went on a rant, didn't I? <laughs> All right. So I'm counting on you guys. Don't let me down. All right? Don't let the country down. You guys are going to be delivering the message to your peer group uh, that uh, this is the greatest country on earth, but only because we have great citizens who are willing to invest their time and energy and effort to become informed on the issues, to argue about it in a uh, respectful way, and uh, to try to s collectively solve the, the many challenges that we face. The good news is, is that there are no challenges, as uh, JFK said, that man creates that man can't solve. I would add women to that. <laughs> All right? Good luck, guys. Bye-bye. All right, guys, I'm not going to try to top that. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't happen every day. But obviously, uh, the President felt strongly enough about your being here to uh, uh, come and spend some time with all of you. So thank you for making the time to be here, and uh, I hope you go and uh, write some good stories about it. All right. See you guys. <laughs>